Hello and welcome to the second lecture for week one of contemporary art. Today I'm just going to talk briefly about the setting for the creation of art in the post-war period. That is the period right after the end of World War II starting with 1945. Now I realize that it's a good 15 years before 1960. However, there are important developments and really canonical figures who emerge in this post-war period both in America and Europe and in Japan that are influential on later developments in contemporary art. So we have to kind of start at the beginning and get a little bit of a prehistory of contemporary art. And so that's where we're starting today with the sort of post-war period. And in fact, there are several things that we need to think about when we think about what happens in the world of art in the immediate aftermath of World War II. First of all, we'll be looking at the effects uh, and talking a little bit about the effects of World War II itself on modern society because it has huge globally reaching effects and are certainly important for America, Europe, and Japan. We also have to consider some important pre-war intellectual and artistic currents, some things that were happening in the 1920s, 1930s that were not erased by World War II, but actually because of some of the changes wrought by World War II were brought even more to the forefront. So we'll be talking about some important theorists, Marcel Duchamp, Walter Benjamin, and uh, Clement Greenberg. We'll also be talking about surrealism and some of the ideas of surrealism that become so important to the um, post-war period. And that's really what we'll be talking about today. In the next couple of lectures, next week, we'll be talking about the effects or the, the sort of post-war period in, in America, and especially the school of abstract expressionism, this, this movement in the 40s and 50s that is hugely important to understanding the development of art in the, the contemporary period and some related things that are going on in Europe and Japan. But really for today, we're just going to talk about the effects of World War II and some of the pre-war intellectual and art currents that are important in this explosion of stuff that happens right after the war. So <clears throat> let's see a little more background. World War II or WWII, okay? World War II was a global conflict. It starts in the 1930s, escalates through the 1930s until by the 1940s it has become a truly global conflict with really uh, huge worldwide casualties and the, these were caused by a variety of things from direct warfare to famine to bombs being dropped on civilian populations. If you think about, if you remember September 11th, 2001, and most of us probably do, and you remember how devastating the feeling was uh, in that immediate aftermath of September 11th, the loss of life, the destruction of property, multiply that by a factor of, I don't even know how much, uh, worldwide casualties from World War II, that is worldwide deaths between civilians and military populations, roughly 72 million people, okay? So the civilian toll is about 47 million people who die either directly because of the war or because of famine and disease that are stirred up by the war. So you can imagine that's a huge amount of casualties. And I mentioned this, you may wonder what this has to do with art, but really this is the psychological background in which art is going to be created in the post-war period. And it's going to heavily influence the theories and the ideas that artists in the post-war period take up and find attractive. Other things that happened during World War II that really caused people to reassess and turn in new directions for their personal lives and for art as well, the Holocaust. This is the deliberate murder of, guesstimates are about six million people, uh, probably a bit more than that when you include uh, uh, all the so-called undesirable populations that the Nazis tried to get rid of, um, this really caused, you know, huge ripples in the intellectual world, trying to figure out how human beings could do this kind of thing to one another. The development of the atom bomb, very famously dropped by the U.S. in Japan on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which wrought destruction on a scale that had not ever been seen previously. So this brings up all sorts of questions about the use of technology and, um, you know, whether technology is good or bad. 
um, the use of biochemical weapons during World War II, another thing that causes people to question what society and technology have been doing in the last 50 years or what have you. Another thing that happens in World War II is just massive numbers of people are displaced from their homes and there are refugee camps all over, all over Europe especially. So there's a, a, a period of questioning and doubt and trauma, instability, um, insecurity, people feeling a little bit like the world has been forever changed. And again, if you think about how deeply September 11th affected all of us, and I'm not downplaying September 11th, it was a terrible tragedy, but that was 3,000 people and a handful of blocks of lower Manhattan compared to enormous territories of Europe and Japan that were destroyed compared to the loss of 72 million people around the globe. So you can just sort of magnify that effect that September 11th had on us in living memory uh, by a huge factor to think about the effect of World War II on the populations of Europe, Japan, and the United States. Another after effect of World War II, of course, is the rise of totalitarian communism. Uh, and that would be the kind of dominant issue in international politics for the next 50 years, the rise of Russia and China as totalitarian communist states. We're not going to get into that too much in this course, but it is something that is an important part of the general development of society in the period in which contemporary art flourishes. There's just a nice graph that gives you a visual for how many people were lost in World War II. The Red bars there indicate the raw number of millions of people. And as you can see, um, the Soviet Union and China lost really a phenomenal number of people. Germany um, lost a phenomenal number of people. You can see the, the raw number of millions of people, right? And then if you look at the blue number, look at the, the blue bar there will tell you the percentage of that country's population that was lost. So. For example, Soviet Union lost almost 24 million people. That translates to about 13% of the population as a whole. Germany lost, what, almost 7.5 million people? That was about 11% of the population. So we're talking about a pretty significant impact on all of these countries. Um, as you can notice, the U.S was quite fortunate in this whole equation in that we did not lose that many people or um, that much percentage of the population. But that's because primarily the people who were affected by this war were soldiers. There weren't very many American civilians involved in the war because it was mostly fought in Europe and Japan. And I also just have a few photos that will give you a little bit of a sense of the scale of destruction. This was a aftermath of an air raid in England during the war. So this is German bombs being dropped on the civilian population of England. Uh, there were lots of bombs dropped on Germany too. And in fact, very terrible destruction among the German civilian population due to fire bombings that just basically burned cities to the ground. So um, this is, you know, suffering that happens across the board in Europe and in Japan. So this is the downtown area of Hiroshima in Japan after the dropping of the atom bomb. It destroyed just square miles, completely obliterated everything in its wake. Uh, and this is the kind of thing that is on people's minds at the end of the war. And it will be the kind of thing that brings up questions about how do you cope with a world in which this kind of stuff happens? How do you find meaning in this kind of a world? What do you do with tradition if tradition produces this kind of stuff? Um, where do you go for solace and comfort? Where was God in all of this? And for a lot of people, the answer would be there would be no God who could let these things happen. Okay, uh, And that's important because that produces, there's a whole school of existential philosophy that becomes very important as an influence on art in the post-war period. And it's all coming out of this environment. Add to that some important things that have been going on in the pre-war period that because of the way that people have been changed by the war are going to become incredibly um, important to the way they think about meaning and art in the post-war period. Uh, and we'll just talk briefly about four important 
things or people or ideas that come from the pre-war period that will influence contemporary art. Marcel Duchamp and the concept of the ready-made, Walter Benjamin and his idea about the effect of mechanical reproduction on works of art, Clement Greenberg and his idea about the difference between high art, what he called avant-garde avant -garde art, and kitsch or just the kind of schmuck that is produced by uh, by the masses for the masses, advertising art and cheesy stuff, okay? Uh, as well as a pre-war movement that really goes back to about the turn of the century, really becomes popular in the 20s and 30s, this um, art and philosophy movement known as surrealism, which is very interested in ideas of the subconscious. First things first, and some of you will be familiar with this object. This is one that I always talk about in my classes. This is the <clears throat> so-called fountain of uh, R. Mutt, as you can see, signed and dated there, R. Mutt 1917, the fountain actually created by Marcel Duchamp. Marcel Duchamp was a French-born artist who was became an American, basically became moved to America because of World War One. So he'd been in the state, or he was in the states in the 19 teens, and became a very important player in the modern movement. You may wonder, because if you look at this, you probably recognize that this is probably not something that R. Mutt sculpted himself. It's actually a urinal that's been placed on its side on a pedestal and called a sculpture. And you may think that's all well and good, but really, what is that all about? Well, I'll tell you. Marcel Duchamp was part of a group in the 19 teens known as the Society of Independent Artists. And this society was trying to get away from tradition, and they decided that it would be great to have a show that was not juried, where anybody who was a member of the Society for Independent Artists could pay their yearly membership and submit whatever they saw fit to become part of the annual exhibition of the Society. The idea here was to get rid of tradition and hidebound academic critics and to really do stuff that was new and to encourage people to do new kinds of art. Duchamp was quite a bit of a game player, you might say. And so he thought, well, let's see if these guys are really, you know, if they're going to put their money where their mouth is. And so he went to Philadelphia, bought a urinal at a plumbing supply shop, mailed it to New York to the Society for Independent Artists with a check for five dollars that was the yearly fee to be a member of the society and saying this is my sculpture fountain I would like to submit it for the Society of Independent Artists exhibition. It actually caused quite a, a ruckus when it got there. The Society for Independent Artists jury committee by the or, or um, exhibition committee they weren't jurying they were just kind of organizing the exhibition of which Marcel Duchamp was a member decided they couldn't possibly exhibit this thing. This wasn't really a work of art. This was a urinal that was placed on its side. And it caused a whole kind of debate and scandal in the art world. But what it did was it really brought some ideas and issues to the fore that continue to be at play even today in contemporary art. So let me tell you a little bit more about what Marcel Duchamp said when the scandal broke. He actually came to the defense of the unknown young artist R. Mutt, who nobody knew and uh, published some essays in some art journals talking about the significance of something like the fountain. One of the places where Duchamp defended the fountain was in a publication called The Blind Man. This was an avant-garde art publication that was published by Alfred Stieglitz, the photographer. And Stieglitz went ahead and made a photograph of the fountain to accompany this article that, that Marcel Duchamp published in The Blind Man. Here is the photograph that Stieglitz took. And the accompanying essay, uh, in the accompanying essay, Marcel Duchamp said, you know, the important thing here is that an artist has made a choice and made a decision. And it is the artist's duty and his job to make us see the world in new ways. So if you look at this fountain and all you can see is something dirty or shameful, something that you know is for people to piss in, then the fault lies with the viewer and not with the object itself. He said, 
when I look at this, I think of a statue of the Buddha. I think of the Virgin Mary. I think of all these associated shapes. I think of something beautiful. Uh, besides, he said, the only great artwork that America has produced is her plumbing and her bridges. And so this is a quintessentially American work of art, creating a new thought for the object, making the viewer see something in a new way, and the viewer being responsible for creating a meaning in a work of art. These are all ideas that become very, very prominent in the contemporary art world. And there on the left you can see this is how the photo was cropped before it was published in The Blind Man. So you can see that it's a very close up of one view of the fountain so that it has that kind of shape. There's a Buddha sculpture on the right just for comparison, right? So it's got that, you can see, all right, there's that kind of same shape. Or if you think of the Virgin Mary with a veil covering her head and shoulders, I, you can sort of see where he's kind of making these analogous comparisons between the fountain and these other art objects. And here's an excerpt from The Blind Man from that article that Duchamp wrote. Whether Mr. Mutt, with his own hands, made the fountain or not, has no importance. He chose it. He took an ordinary article of life, placed it so that its useful significance disappeared under a new title and point of view. He created a new thought for the object. And that is where we're getting to the heart of something that will be so important in the contemporary world. This idea that what an artist does is not just churn out beauty that can be accomplished by other means. It's actually creating thoughts for objects. It's giving new meaning to things. It's the artist's vision that is the most important thing. It's not whether or not something is pretty. So here's another example of Duchamp's work. This is a <clears throat> so-called ready-made that he, or a rectified ready-made that he created in the teens uh, called Bicycle Wheel. And as you can see, it is a bicycle wheel uh, mounted onto a stool, right? And this is what Duchamp liked to do. He believed in the idea that the concept uh, was what made something a work of art. He liked the ready-made object, taking something out of its familiar context, putting it into something new, the concept, the idea, that is what's important, not the actual object itself. And he also was a firm believer in this idea that it's the viewer who's responsible for completing the work of art. The viewer has to give the work of art meaning. It's not something that's self-contained in the work of art. It's not something that's only created by the artist. These are ideas that become crucially important in the, in the contemporary art world from 45 onward until today. And so it's important to be slightly familiar with the pioneering work of Duchamp in the 19 teens. Here's another one of his ready-mades. This is, as you can see, a snow shovel that he purchased at a hardware store. He engraved on the handle in advance of a broken arm. And that became his rectified ready-made. And here, another quote from Duchamp about the idea of the ready-made. The choice was made based on a reaction of visual indifference, a total absence of good or bad taste, a complete anesthesia. So he's a guy who's trying to reject tradition and go into some new directions for art. Um, just like with World War II, more in the after effects of World War I, in this generation that Duchamp is a member of, there's this real feeling of, you know, to hell with tradition. Tradition hasn't gotten us anywhere. We need to go somewhere new with art. And so that's where this kind of idea starts to percolate. And there's just another example of Duchamp and his games playing. This is Duchamp dressed up as his female alter ego, Rose Selavie. Uh, if you say Rose Selavie in French, it sounds like Eros C'est la Vie which just translates to love that's life. And so here again, I mean, I don't think we're as easily shockable maybe as people were in the 19 teens and 20s. So like a man dressing up like a woman may not be that much of a, a stretch for us, but this was really quite shocking when he did it in the 1920s. Uh, and he often used this female alter ego who was also, her name was a pun, um, to try to get away from traditional notions of art. And here's another example of Duchamp and his break with tradition and his playing with the idea of high art and kitsch. And as we'll see later, uh, things like Walter Benjamin's 
thoughts about what happens when a work of art becomes reproduced so much that it almost loses its meaning. Uh, this is his postcard from the Louvre of the Mona Lisa on which he has drawn, as you can see, a mustache and goatee. Across the bottom, Duchamp has written the letters L-H-O-O-Q. If you say the letters L-H-O-O-Q in French, the way they're pronounced in French, L-H-O-O-Q, that sounds, it's a homonym for, or a pun on a sentence. The sentence is, translates loosely as, she has a hot ass, okay? Elle a chaud au cul, she has a hot ass. Uh, this is another way of deflating tradition, you know? By the 19-teens, I mean, the Mona Lisa was already an incredibly venerated art object. It had been the subject of an attempted theft and a couple of assassination attacks where a guy threw acid on the Mona Lisa. Um, it had been, acquired such great significance in high culture, you know, as an important art object that uh, Duchamp wanted to just sort of puncture that idea, you know, um, by making a rectified ready-made postcard, making fun of the way that people salivate over the Mona Lisa. And there's, of course, the original Mona Lisa. And here's a, the Mona Lisa as it is at the Louvre now, as you can see behind bulletproof glass, um, so that people can't get up to it and do any damage to it. But there it is, everybody trying to get close to it. And here, just some of the ways that Mona Lisa has been dealt with in popular culture over the centuries, right? Uh, <clears throat> just playing around with this very, very iconic image. And even Warhol had his crack at the Mona Lisa, so there she is, reproduced hundreds of times in uh, screen printing by Andy Warhol. One thing I'd like you to do after hearing this lecture is to go to the readings for this week and read the handout that has some excerpts from Clement Greenberg and Walter Benjamin, and to think about these questions. What is kitsch according to Clement Greenberg? How do modern appropriations of the Mona Lisa fit into this idea of kitsch? And how do these kind of versions of the Mona Lisa illustrate Benjamin's claims about the effect of mechanical reproduction on the work of art? How does it destroy the aura of a work of art to be massively reproduced and incredibly familiar? So those are things that are posted on Blackboard, including links to the entire readings for, from Clement Greenberg and Walter Benjamin. I'm not asking you to read the whole thing, just read that uh, handout unless you're interested. Um, but this is something to think about this week because these are ideas that are going to keep percolating throughout the term. And here, after you've read Greenberg, another thing to think about. One thing that he really liked was art that was truly high art. And one thing he says that distinguishes high art from craft, okay, or high art from kitsch, high art from popular culture, is how easy it is to understand, right? How much you need to be schooled and trained in theory to really understand what's going on in a picture. And looking at these two, from not too many years apart, I think you can probably guess which one of these would classify as kitsch and one, which one would classify as art according to Greenberg. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about Duchamp and his ideas of the ready-made. I've mentioned Greenberg and Benjamin, and you'll be reading more about them this week. One other important pre-war trend to consider before we wrap up, and that is this pre-war art movement known as surrealism. Here I've got on the, the slide for you a famous definition of what surrealism is by one of the leading surrealists, a guy named André Breton. Uh, surrealism was a philosophical and artistic movement that embraced the idea of getting rid of all of your civilized um, ego, all of your lessons that you've learned about suppressing your internal desires and getting back to a really baseline authentic self, almost like getting rid of all your culture to get back to your lizard brain, okay? Um, not filtering out anything. Uh, this was thought to be an achievable goal that the surrealists were trying to figure out how to do in music, poetry, art, and philosophy. Get rid of all this tradition, get rid of all of this extraneous stuff, and get back to a kind of authentic, pre-verbal, 
pre-civilized self. There are two really main ways of trying to go about that in the visual arts. One is represented here in the work of Juan Miro, who is an artist from Barcelona, Spain. This is just one of many of his paintings. Um, he did painting and drawing in this style, or in this technique known as automatic drawing, where he would basically get a canvas or a piece of paper, close his eyes and start tracing designs without trying to think about what they were, close his eyes, not even look at the canvas, and um, scribble on the canvas or on the piece of paper. When he was done, or felt he was done, he would open his eyes and look at what he had there, and then try to pick out the subconscious symbols that he had been drawing without meaning to draw. And that is where these paintings originate, is in these kind of squiggles and doodles that are done subconsciously, and then he would go back and look, oh, that looks a little like an eyeball, oh, that looks like a sperm, oh, that looks like a star. So all these kinds of almost elemental or primitive symbols that he would try to pick out from the um, doodles that he had created subconsciously. So this is one way of trying to get at the expression of the subconscious that the surrealists embraced, and that is this idea of automatic drawing or automatic um, painting. And that's something that we'll see in the post-war period that people take up and, and run with. The other way to try to depict the subconscious in the surrealist movement was to make visually convincing pictures that represent things that couldn't possibly be. And really the poster boy for this version of surrealism is Salvador Dali. Also, it happens from the same um, region of Spain that Juan Miró is from, from Catalonia. So here's probably Dali's most famous painting, The Persistence of Memory, where as you can see, he's using sort of old school techniques, very atmospheric, use of perspective, um, very realistic looking textures, but to create a thing that we know couldn't possibly be. Right, that kind of hot water bottle of a face deflated there laying on the ground in this very weird alien looking landscape with the melting clock faces. All of this meant to be symbolic of stuff that's going on in Dali's subconscious. Although it's a visually recognizable picture, it's of a place none of us have ever been. It's the inside of Dali's brain. And this will be another way to do surrealism that um, will have some influence on the post-war period. What we'll be talking about next time when we meet is the aftermath, or what happens in the aftermath of World War II specifically. And we'll start by looking at New York, and then we'll also look at Europe, and we'll look at Japan. Uh, America really becomes the center of the post-war art world for a number of reasons, the first of which is just that America becomes the kind of transcendent economic and political superpower in the wake of World War II for a variety of reasons. And lots of people who had been important players in, the cont in contemporary art in the pre-war period will move to New York uh, and they will take their philosophies with them and that will become the new epicenter of, of cutting edge theory and cutting edge technique in contemporary art. And so that's what we'll talk about when we meet next time in week two.